concludes general questions. We move on now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, the Justice Secretary tries to close down questions over his role regarding Police Scotland and the position of the Chief Constable, and he failed. And since then, we've had lawyers and senior police officers exchanging further blows. We've had more evidence of details being kept from this Parliament, and most worryingly, we've had an admission that no record exists of the meeting when Michael Matheson intervened over the Chief Constable's return to work. So can I ask the First Minister, does she really believe that this fiasco has shown a functioning system that is either transparent or accountable? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say to Ruth Davidson that the Justice Secretary did not try to close down the issue. What the Justice Secretary did was come to this chamber, make a statement and answer questions in a robust and comprehensive way. And that is the accountability this parliament and indeed the wider country should expect from the government and from individual ministers. And what Michael Matheson set out, which I will set out again today, is this. There is a, a role for the Scottish government, there is a role for the Justice Secretary uh, in making sure that the Scottish Police Authority carries out its uh, functions properly. Of course, the decisions about the employment of the Chief Constable are for the Scottish Police Authority. That division of responsibility is very clear uh, and well understood. Uh, and Michael Matheson was right uh, when faced with uh, the, the news that the Scottish Police Authority were inviting the Chief Constable back to work the, the very next day uh, from that meeting uh, to ask questions such as, uh, had Perk been consulted given the ongoing investigation into uh, allegations about the Chief Constable? And had the senior command uh, in Police Scotland been consulted uh, and had steps been taken to ensure the welfare of any police officer that had raised concerns? And he wasn't able to be satisfied on those uh, matters. And that's why the then chair of the Scottish Police Authority uh, looked at the matter again. Now, I'm not sure uh, what Ruth Davidson would have said if the following day to that meeting, the Chief Constable had turned up at work again. Uh, no doubt that would have created a great deal of controversy. Uh, and when, as undoubtedly they would have done, MSPs had rightly started asking questions, had it transpired that the Justice Secretary had asked none of those questions, then we would have had opposition leaders, uh, in that case, I think, justifiably coming to this chamber, asking why not. So the Justice Secretary has acted entirely appropriately, and I would have thought all people across the chamber would welcome that fact. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister repeats the Justice Secretary's comments for last week, but this goes a lot further. This is about whether the Justice Secretary acted unlawfully by directing the Scottish Police Authority to stop the Chief Constable coming back to work against their own recommendations. And the truth is, we don't know. In fact, we can't know. Because last Thursday, Michael Matheson said he'd be happy for minutes of his meeting with the SPA to be released, only for the SNP government to then claim that, incredibly, no minutes had been taken. So the Justice Secretary takes this massive decision to intervene to stop the head of Scotland's police force from returning to work, and there's no written record. I think that's shocking, and why doesn't the First Minister? First Minister. Well, I think there are a number of, of relevant points uh, to be made here. The first one, and I, I made this point last week uh, in response to a, a Tory backbencher. Week after week, uh, in this chamber and in the media, we hear opposition MSPs effectively accusing the Scottish Government of not intervening enough in the operation uh, of Police Scotland. Uh, and now we have opposition uh, leaders coming here complaining that the Justice Secretary asks legitimate questions. The Justice Secretary did not instruct the Chair uh, of the Scottish Police Authority. What the Justice Secretary did was ask questions. And I say again, had the Justice Secretary not asked these questions and the Chief Constable had returned to work, I am absolutely sure that Ruth Davidson would have been amongst the first to get to her feet and demand to know why the Justice Secretary hadn't asked these questions. And finally, Presiding Officer, we do know uh, what the Justice Secretary asked because the Justice Secretary came to this chamber last week and answered questions on that very matter. Ruth Davidson. <laughs> Presiding officer, we've got to a point 
where the Cabinet Secretary intervenes to stop the Chief Constable coming back to work, but with no official record of the meeting, and this Parliament was not informed until six weeks later, and the First Minister stands there and says it's fine by her. And then to cap it all off, we have the former Justice Secretary, Kenny McCaskill, saying that it was just a chat, there was no need to take minutes, the public don't need to know anything about anything, just trust the SNP. Well, we can't. Last year, three other senior police officers were suspended, and in those cases, the Justice Secretary couldn't have been clearer. He insisted repeatedly that he could not intervene and that we must respect the process. And the problem is, he said that after he had already secretly intervened in the case of the Chief Constable. So can the First Minister explain, why did the Justice Secretary tell Parliament that the law stopped him from intervening in disciplinary matters when just weeks before he had privately done the opposite? First Minister. The Justice Secretary did not intervene in a disciplinary matter. The Justice Secretary asked legitimate questions of the SPA to determine whether the SPA had carried out its functions appropriately. Legitimate questions. And let me be very clear to this chamber, presiding officer. Uh, my Justice Secretary asking legitimate questions uh, is not just fine by me. I expect that of my Justice Secretary. I expect my Justice Secretary to do the job that he is appointed to do. And again, I would simply ask Ruth Davidson uh, this question. Uh, had the Chief Constable, uh, the day after that meeting, turned up at his work and it turned out that uh, questions, uh, Perk had not been consulted, that the senior command had not been consulted, uh, that no steps had been taken to protect the welfare of police officers, and had it turned up, because no doubt the first thing uh, that Ruth Davidson and other opposition MSPs would have asked is, what did the Justice Secretary do? What questions did the Justice Secretary ask? And had it turned out that the Justice Secretary had simply folded his arms and not bothered to ask any questions about whether the SPA had carried out its functions appropriately, then Ruth Davids would be standing here probably asking me if I still had confidence in my Justice Secretary. The hypocrisy of the Tories on this is quite breathtaking. The Justice Secretary did his job and he did his job properly on behalf of the people of this country. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, I believe the public have a right to see the decisions the government takes, not have them taken behind closed doors and in secret. And it seems that the rules governing our police service are whatever the SNP decide they want them to be. Yeah. We have ministers intervening in private while telling Parliament that they can't. And we have promises to be transparent while meetings are taking place without any record of what is going on. It's the SNP's secret Scotland, and it stinks. And we have to act. It is clear, it is clear that the legal framework does not ensure proper accountability. And we say it's time to amend the law so it's this parliament, not that government, that has more power over our national force. The First Minister, the First Minister knows that she will find support from across the chamber for changes here, and it's her chance to show that she's listening for once. Will she? First Minister. The public do know because the Justice Secretary came to this chamber last week and answered questions. Uh, there is a distinction between the operational independence of the police and, of course, uh, in terms of disciplinary and other matters of the Scottish Police Authority. And the Justice Secretary did not intervene in matters where he should not have done. But it is the job of the Justice Secretary to make sure the Scottish Police Authority, as a public body, is carrying out its duties appropriately. Exactly. And that is exactly, exactly what the Justice Secretary uh, did. I, I'm not sure what Ruth Davidson uh, is, is actually arguing here. I'm not sure if she is arguing that the Chief Constable should have been allowed simply to come back to work without any of the appropriate questions being asked. So the Justice Secretary uh, is accountable to uh, this Parliament, has uh, given a statement in this Parliament. Of course, the relevant committee of this Parliament is looking into the matter uh, as well and no doubt will ask uh, further questions. Uh, but the Justice Secretary acted appropriately and will continue to do so. Uh, Presiding officer, I can't help thinking that this week of all weeks, what we are getting here from Ruth Davidson today is a deflection. Uh, a deflection in the week when we saw her party fail abysmally to stand up for Scotland 
on important matters related to Brexit. The week that we found out that the Scottish Tories don't have a backbone between them, they're nothing more than lobby fodder. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. One of the foremost reasons for growing pressure on the NHS is a growing crisis in care provision. The sector is on the brink of collapse. Demand for high quality care homes for our elderly is rising. As a result, Scotland needs at least 1,200 more care home places a year to meet that demand. So can the First Minister tell us how she plans to do that? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, while I recognise the challenges in uh, social care, I don't agree uh, with Richard Leonard that the sector is uh, on the verge of collapse. I think that does a disservice to those uh, who work in that sector. Uh, of course, in the current financial year, almost half a billion pounds of frontline NHS spending uh, will be invested in social care services and in integration of health and social care. Uh, that will continue to support the delivery of, amongst other things, a living wage for adult care workers, and it will increase payments for pre free personal and nursing care. Uh, in the next financial year, we will give an additional £66 million to local government to bring the Carers Scotland Act into force and maintain payment of the living wage. Over the past three years, funding through the National Care Home contract has increased by more than 13 percent which uh, helps independent care providers invest in their staff uh, the quality of their service uh, and of course to make a, a return out of their business uh, of course there are uh, some uh, care homes build care homes for example right now uh, which is in difficulty and our priority is to ensure continuity of care uh, for those residents with no compromise whatsoever in the quality uh, of their care in fact uh, Scottish government officials are meeting uh, build uh, I think today the cabinet secretary for health will meet uh, them later this month and we will do everything we can to protect the interests of residents in very regrettable situations like that one. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. I'm glad that the First Minister raised uh, Beald Homes because last Saturday Labour MSPs attending a Save Our Beald campaign group meeting in Glasgow. They heard at first hand families tell of the stress that their frail elderly relatives are under because they are about to be evicted from their specialist care homes. First Minister, these are people in their 70s, their 80s, some are even in their 90s being evicted. One woman, Nancy Sutherland, is 94. She's been a Beale tenant for 23 years and along with 166 other elderly people, she's about to lose her home. Mrs. Sutherland has dementia, so every day she relives the trauma. Every day she asks her daughter where she will be moving to, and every day her anxiety levels rise. They rise because her daughter has no answer. Does the First Minister? Well, First Minister. Can I say to Richard Leonard, firstly, um, I appreciate him raising this issue because it's an important issue in general, but particularly for the residents of uh, Beald Care Homes. Uh, and it's exactly because we recognise how unsettling, indeed how traumatic uh, this decision has been and will be for uh, residents, their families and employees, that the Scottish Government will continue to work to ensure that we uh, do everything we can uh, to guarantee continuity of care uh, for Beald residents uh, and make sure there is no compromise whatsoever in the quality of their care. So since being alerted uh, to Beale's decision, uh, we have engaged with the company, the care inspectorate, the chief officers uh, of integration authorities to ensure that plans are being put in place for residents. As I said in uh, my earlier answer, officials are meeting with Beale today. The cabinet secretary will personally meet with Beale uh, later this month to discuss the progress of that work. The national contingency planning group, uh, which of course includes the government cause, the care inspector, the integration authorities, uh, trade unions and providers is also uh, engaged in this issue. The, the group uh, in particular considers how national and local partners manage the impact of decisions like this in respect of, of residents, their families and of course the workforce. So this is a, a vitally important issue and that's why the Scottish Government has been uh, and will continue to be engaged in making sure the interests of residents are protected. Richard Leonard. Um, can I thank the First Minister for the tone uh, of the answer and remind her that uh, she told this chamber uh, last March that she was absolutely committed 
to protect the most vulnerable people and ensure that supported accommodation is put on a sustainable and secure uh, financial footing. But I'm bound to ask where that protection and commitment to those most vulnerable people is now. Scottish Care's Chief Executive, Dr Donald McCaskill, has warned her government that the care home sector is in a fragile position. He has said that the Beale situation should, and I quote him, act as a wake-up call to properly fund care in Scotland. And yet we know that instead it faces cuts. Week after week, my party makes the case against these cuts, your cuts, cuts which affect people like Mrs Sutherland and too many others like her. First Minister, your care policies are failing. Surely you must see that the time has come for your government to stop the cuts to lifeline services, or will you continue to fail people like Mrs Sutherland? First Minister. Well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if Richard Leonard actually listened to the first answer I, I gave to him, where I pointed out that over the past three years, funding for the National Care Home contract has actually increased by more than 13 now, I think that is a recognition uh, that this government understands the challenges that the care home sector faces and are working with them, including with Scottish Care, uh, to address those challenges, and we will continue to do so. Uh, I've already addressed the issue around build care homes, uh, but you know, as well as uh, the care home sector, uh, we're also seeing extension of uh, care delivered uh, at home. The hours of home care delivered in Scotland has uh, increased uh, in the last year uh, by 11%, I think. So across all of these different aspects of care, we're taking action to make sure that the interests of our older people, and we know this will become increasingly important because of the aging nature of our population. Now, I, uh, I'm not particularly keen to get into a, a political to and fro over a, an issue that is so important to the interests of so many older people. Uh, but you know, Richard Leonard uh, has mentioned uh, the budget. We're putting forward a budget that is about protecting public services, uh, investing an additional £400 million in our National Health Service, for example, giving a fair deal to local authorities. Yesterday, we agreed with the Greens a motion that says that we are open to amendments from other parties uh, ahead of the next stage uh, of the budget. I think it was regrettable that on uh, a motion that at the end of the day yesterday talked about protecting public services, giving a fair wage increase yeah. to public sector uh, workers, instead of voting with the SNP and with the Greens, Labour actually voted with the Tories against these things. It is utterly inexplicable. So if Richard Leonard wants to engage properly in the remainder of the budget process, assuming he can get a tax policy together before then, I will welcome that and we can have constructive discussions about how to make sure that we do continue to deliver on the very important issues that he has raised today. And some constituency questions. The first from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that North Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership has decided to cease its £75,000 a year grant to food train North Ayrshire from 31st of March. 172 vulnerable elderly people, 43% of whom are aged 85 or older, will be denied a vital service that allows them to stay in their own homes, rather than, in some instances, being taken into care at a cost of £26,869 per person per year. Highspout constituents have told me that the volunteer who delivers their food is often the only person they speak to each week. Does the First Minister agree that the decision to cease funding of food train North Ayrshire is a penny-wise, pound-foolish decision which should be urgently reconsidered and indeed reversed? First Minister. Well, food train does uh, a lot of good work. The Scottish Government has provided funding in previous years to pilot the food train, uh, which has been expanded to a number of local authority areas. Now, responsibility for the commissioning and delivery of services lies with North Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership. However, I will uh, ask the Minister for Public Health to examine this situation further. I'm sure we would all want to recognise the very important contribution made by the volunteers who've been delivering the food train service so successfully in North Ayrshire. Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, last week, Chief Superintendent Paul Anderson said that mental health demands are the greatest challenge facing his officers in the city of Dundee. Does the First Minister agree with me that the time has now come for a mental health accident and emergency facility open seven days a week 
over the weekend with access to specialist nurses, doctors and counsellors for this kind of facility to open in Dundee and in other places across Scotland that desperately need it. First Minister. Uh, well, broadly speaking, yes, I do uh, agree. Uh, in, indeed, uh, one of the factors behind uh, the future strategy for policing in Scotland is about the changing nature of demand. And, and certainly when I speak to senior police officers, uh, they often talk about uh, mental health and the additional demands that is putting on the police. It is also, of course, why uh, last year I announced uh, through our mental health strategy additional funding uh, to have mental health workers in places like police stations and, and prisons, for example, uh, to recognise uh, that that there is often a need for mental health support across a range of different settings. So these are uh, issues that are being taken forward through our mental health strategy and they're issues that I hope uh, will attract cross-party support from right across the chamber. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. This week, the Airdrie and Cope Bridge advertiser brought to my attention the heartbreaking case of 17-year-old Kyle Laird from Cope Bridge, whose mother unexpectedly passed away over the festive season. Kyle's mother was a lone parent and he is now financially responsible for himself and his family home. Kyle is actively seeking work but is struggling to make ends meet due to gaps in the benefit system. What support can the Scottish Government give to Kyle and other young people who have no um, parental support and qualify for only limited support through the benefit system to remain in their own homes? First Minister. Well, firstly, I'm sure we would all want to convey our uh, condolences to Kyle on the passing of his, his mother and the, the, the dreadful, heartbreaking situation he now finds himself in. Obviously, I, I don't know all of the details of, of Kyle's circumstances. I would be uh, very happy to uh, ask the Social Security Minister and indeed the Economy Minister uh, to speak to the member to see whether there is any uh, support that the Scottish Government could provide or point uh, Kyle to. Um, I think uh, everybody knows uh, the concerns I have about the operation of the benefit system. I, uh, visited Startup Stirling uh, yesterday, a, a fantastic organisation that's doing a great amount of work uh, principally around food support for people uh, who are falling victim of uh, the benefit system and I spoke to uh, two individuals in particular there who tell uh, the story of uh, the problems that Universal Credit in their case uh, have created for them. Uh, the, the benefit system, the welfare system in any country should be a safety net and it should be there to support people uh, and help people in times of need, not push them further into poverty. Unfortunately, all too often, it is doing the latter rather than the former and perhaps uh, the case that's just been raised as an example of that. But I would be very happy to have ministers look into uh, Kyle's particular uh, situation and I'm sure all of us wish him uh, the very best. And Joanne Lamond. Thank you very much, presiding officer. On Saturday, I had the privilege of taking up the invitation, which I think was extended to all MSPs to attend the Save Our Build um, campaign uh, to hear directly the consequences of the decision by Build to revise its business model, a revision which has effectively led um, planned eviction of elderly residents from their homes and the potential loss of 300 jobs um, from a workforce that does its best by these residents. And I think if these, re these 300 jobs were all located in the one place, perhaps there would have been more effective action already. Can I ask, I hear what the First Minister said about all of the meetings that are taking place, but will she direct her Cabinet Secretary now to meet with the Safe Our Build campaign and union representatives as a matter of urgency to identify how the Scottish Government will protect the rights of older people to be treated with proper respect and ensure that the staff facing huge uncertainty in terms of their own jobs can be told what the Scottish Government will do to support them at this very difficult time. First Minister. Well, the Health Secretary, of course, will be happy to meet with any interested parties, uh, given the, the seriousness of the situation. I, I won't repeat everything I said in response to Richard Leonard, but I absolutely, when I was uh, Health Secretary, I uh, dealt with a, a similar situation in terms of the, the collapse of a, a care home company, and I know how difficult that was for the, the residents involved, and how difficult it was for all of the partners to come together to find the solutions. Uh, the Scottish Government, for its part, will continue to work with anybody and everybody to find the solutions here that are in the interest of residents and we will uh, be happy to meet with others who want to achieve the same outcome. Question three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. I, I'm sure the First Minister is aware of some of the work that my colleague Andy Whiteman has done with his Homes First campaign, drawing awareness to the impact of the incredible rise in short-term letting. This is an impact that is uh, being felt in Edinburgh as well as around the country. It's damaging to communities. Uh, it ri raises the, the cost of homes being let for permanent homes for people to live in. 
Uh, and for many people, particularly for, in, in examples close to Parliament, even where an entire stairwell has been turned over uh, to short term, let's say for a single lone resident list, it has a terribly damaging impact on people's mental health as well. The changes announced today by one major platform, Airbnb, will not undermine the business model of those who want to convert entire properties to short-term letting. Does the First Minister accept that there is a huge difference between what's generally called the collaborative economy of people putting a spare room in their own home uh, up for short-term let and the conversion of entire properties to effectively many hotels which operate without paying uh, any business taxes uh, and which distort the housing market in this way? First Minister. Well, there are a range of important issues uh, that we do need to consider here. I think Patrick Harvey is, is right to raise them. I, I certainly understand the pressure in some parts of the country, not in all of the country, uh, for new controls over short-term letting of residential properties, and, and we certainly will consider uh, any appropriate changes in the period ahead. Uh, Patrick Harvey uh, mentioned the, the collaborative economy. He, I know, will be aware that there is currently an expert panel on the collaborative economy that has been gathering a, a wide evidence base, I have to say, on a range of topics, but including on the topic of short-term lets. Uh, the chair of the panel, Helen Golden of the Young Foundation, uh, actually met with the Economy Secretary earlier this week. Uh, we understand that the panel's full report is due to be published shortly and we will uh, certainly consider the recommendations uh, that it makes and then uh, make a decision on what action it is appropriate to take. Patrick Harvey. I am certainly aware that the, the report on the collaborative economy is due soon and we'll all take an interest in it because there are many opportunities from that as well. But I say again, there is a huge difference between the collaborative economy and the exploitative housing economy that we're beginning to see. And Airbnb themselves are members of the government's expert group on the collaborative economy. So we should not be looking to them for solutions to that particular problem. The impact on the housing market is our responsibility as parliament and the first minister's responsibility on behalf of government. And we can only resolve those issues by giving councils the power to regulate. This could be done relatively simply. The government can allow councils to use planning use class orders to make it clear that there's a distinction between a home being a home and a home being converted into a mini hotel using continual short-term lets. Will the First Minister agree about this important distinction between a collaborative economy and the exploitative economy? And does she agree that councils should have the option None would need to use it where they don't think it's a problem, but they need to have the option to use this mechanism to control the growth of short-term lets and ensure that the housing market operates for homes first. First Minister. Well, just one point of clarification first. I mean, Patrick Harvey said that Airbnb was on the expert panel. I understand that is true, but I think it's important to point out for balance. So is the STUC on that expert panel. So uh, I think it is a, a panel that we should... Uh, be interested in in terms of the recommendations they bring forward. I, I do recognise, I, I think I did in my earlier comments, the distinction that Patrick Harvey is making. I think everybody would recognise that distinction. It's important to point out that it is for the planning authority, which in the case of Edinburgh would be the City of Edinburgh Council, to consider the evidence uh, case by case on whether the principal use of a property has changed from residential to business use. Uh, I know that there is an argument that some make that uh, new powers uh, are are required. I am not ruling that out. Uh, what I'm simply saying is given that this expert panel is meeting right now, it's taking evidence. I readily acknowledge it's taking evidence on a range of issues, but it is looking at the issue of short-term lets. And given that this panel's report is due to be published shortly, I think it makes sense to wait until that report is published, consider the evidence, consider the recommendations that it brings forward, and then decide on what changes might be appropriate and bring them forward at that time. So we can continue to look very carefully at this and we'll continue to listen to and hear ideas from uh, across the, the chamber but also uh, from a, a wider perspective than that. And some additional supplementaries from, uh, first from Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. After last year's general election, we heard great boasts from Ruth Davidson that her troop of Scottish Tory MPs would fight for Scotland's interests and more powers for Holyrood. Does the First Minister think we've seen much evidence of that this week? First Minister. Uh, no. <laughs> as, as I said earlier on, I think we're still trying to locate a backbone 
uh, amongst the, the group of Scottish Tory MPs. This is a, this is a really serious issue, presiding officer. Uh, I think we know from the committee report that was published that across this chamber, uh, MSPs of all parties think that the withdrawal bill in its current form represents a power grab on this parliament. And yet when there was an amendment lodged by Labour in the House of Commons yeah. this week to help rectify that, instead yeah. of supporting that amendment, mm. uh, the Scottish uh, Tory group voted with the government against the interests Lobby of Scotland. Them. In fact, there's not been one Lobby single occasion on the part of any of the Scottish Tory MPs, I think with the exception of one uh, measly abstention somewhere along the line, there's not been one single occasion where a single Scottish Tory MP has voted in the interests of Scotland against the Westminster government. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, perhaps on a more consensual note, um, I take this opportunity to congratulate Sorica Cantwell in the gallery today, who was recognised as a Clean Up Scotland hero by Keep Scotland Beautiful for her time dedicated to cleaning up plastic pollution on our beaches. Will the First Minister explain how the Scottish Government can best encourage and support such individual and community and sectoral initiatives, for example, with a supply of equipment, to help us all tackle this global problem? First Minister. Well, I, I thank Claudia Beamish for raising this. Can I take the opportunity to pay tribute to the work of uh, Sorka Cantwell? Uh, and uh, I think her work serves as a reminder that all of us have a responsibility to do more to tackle the throwaway culture and the issue of uh, plastics, particularly in our seas. Uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, the Environment Secretary has just met with Ms Cantwell uh, to discuss the work that she's been doing. Um, the Scottish Government, as I said uh, last week, has been leading the way in taking action for some time now. We've already introduced a more comprehensive carrier bag charge. We will develop a deposit return scheme for Scotland and last week Rosanna Cunningham announced plans to ban the manufacture and sale of plastic cotton buds uh, and we'll become the first country in the UK to do so. Uh, we're also currently considering how to tackle the issue of plastic straws and disposable coffee cups. Uh, I know there's a need to go even further. Uh, the, the Cabinet discussed this uh, on Tuesday, how we continue to make sure that Scotland is a leader uh, in tackling this issue that is such a blight on our environment. Question for Richard Lockett. Can I ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding concerns expressed by the Scotch whisky industry regarding the possible consequences of Brexit for customs arrangements? First Minister. The Scottish Government is in regular dialogue with the Scottish whisky industry. Uh, we are aware of uh, their concerns regarding the introduction of a new computer system by HM Revenue and Customs for collecting duties and taxes for goods entering and leaving the UK. Uh, the industry believes that leaving the EU will increase transactions fivefold. Uh, that's an extra burden on industry which is completely unnecessary and is one of the many reasons we've argued uh, that uh, leaving the EU will significantly weaken our economy uh, compared to continued membership of the EU, but the least damaging option is to remain within the single market, and I hope that's something members right across the chamber will support. Richard Lockhead. I thank the First Minister for her answer, and I'm sure she's aware that 90% of Scotch whisky is exported, and a third of these exports go to the EU, which represents 10% of all Scottish exports to the EU. Is the First Minister aware that with the UK Government rushing headlong into a hard Brexit, there's now increasing concerns being expressed by the Scotch whisky industry over the potential for confusion and chaos at customs posts, given that the industry needs plenty of advance notice of new arrangements, a smooth process, and to avoid congestion and delay in getting their goods to market? And now, with the clock ticking, will the First Minister continue to apply maximum pressure on the UK Government to recognise the importance of the Scotch whisky industry and indeed Scottish food and drink generally. And also similar concerns have been expressed by Rotterdam Port uh, as well about the impact of, of Brexit. And does she agree that this is a perfect example of why the Conservative Party's political dogma and determination to leave the single market okay, and Mr. customs Lockhead. union okay, Mr. Lockhead, is detrimental to Scotland's minister. national interests? I can't actually believe that the Tories were groaning and moaning through a question about one of our most important yeah. industries. Yeah. I think it speaks that. volumes. Uh, the whisky industry, as Richard Lockhead has said, contributes hugely to Scottish exports. Uh, and I think the concerns of the whisky industry provide a case study 
in the self-destructive futility uh, of leaving the single market. But it's not just whisky uh, that has these concerns. The Food Sector Resilience Group, chaired by the Scottish Government, brings together associations across the food and drink supply chain, uh, as well as other uh, public sector bodies. That group is meeting as we speak and will be discussing the impact of customs issues uh, and possible disruption of ports in England, which could have a really damaging effect on all of Scotland's uh, exporters. It's exactly that kind of concern that uh, drives our analysis that Brexit could hit our GDP uh, to the tune of up to £2,300 for every person in Scotland. Uh, I don't want us to leave the EU at all, but if uh, the UK is intent on that, then we must stay within the single market. I remember the day not long after the EU referendum when Ruth Davidson stood in this chamber and challenged me to make sure we protected our place in the single market. Now she just meekly does as she's told. Well, we will continue to stand up for Scotland's interests. Question number five, Finlay Carson. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government is providing to the inshore fishing industry. First Minister. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of fishing to many of our coastal communities. Through our inshore fishery strategy, we're working with fishing businesses and organisations around Scotland to deliver a more sustainable, profitable and well-managed inshore sector. Uh, this includes conservation measures for important inshore species, supporting inshore fisheries groups and a £1.5 million programme of investment to improve data collection from our inshore fishing fleet. Tony Carson. I thank the First Minister for her response. The First Minister is aware of the great importance that the scallop fishing industry plays in the economy of the southwest of Scotland. And I believe that the First Minister was scheduled to discuss issues regarding the 2012 Fisheries Management Agreement with the Isle of Man's Chief Minister this morning. And I sincerely hope those discussions were successful. Concerns about the potential of the Isle of Man introducing conservation measures, which were more about protectionism than conservation, were raised by me back in August 2017 in a letter to the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing. Can I ask, why did it take until late December for the Cabinet Secretary to take any meaningful action on the concerns of the Scallop Fleet? Why it has taken the intervention of the First Minister to sort out the mess, partly due to the late intervention of Fergus Ewing? And will she apologise on behalf of her Cabinet Secretary for the unnecessary inconvenience and deep concern caused to the Scottish Scallop Fleet and associated businesses. First Minister. Well, let me, let me deal quite, uh, quickly, first of all, with Finlay Carson's uh, comments about the Scottish Government. And let me just, uh, I suppose, put on record some of the comments of those who work in the sector. So, Chief Executive of the Scottish White Fish Producers Association, great support for our scallop fishermen from the Scottish Government. Uh, the West Coast uh, Sea Products, which is a kukubri based processor owner of vessels, uh, welcome the action being taken by the Scottish Government uh, to invoke the dispute resolution process. So the Scottish Government has been acting on behalf uh, of our, our scallop fishermen. Now, as uh, Finlay Carson uh, says, I, I actually spoke with the Chief Minister of the Isle of Man this morning. I made very clear our opposition to the restrictions that the Isle of Man has put in place. I made very clear our view, which I I uh, accept that the Isle of Man disagree with, but our strong view that those restrictions actually breach the fisheries management agreement that is in place. And uh, I also said that we would uh, use the dispute resolution mechanism should uh, a resolution not be found. I'm glad to say the discussion with the Chief Minister was uh, very constructive and very uh, positive this morning. The Isle of Man uh, will review their position and I am very hopeful uh, that we will reach a mutually satisfactory resolution of this within the next week. So hopefully we will get to uh, a, a position on this which is in the interest uh, of our scallop fishermen and it will be because partly uh, of the action that Fergus Ewing has been taking. Question number six, Monica Lennon. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the campaign for Freedom of Information in Scotland's campaign, Get It Minuted. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government is fully committed to openness and transparency. Um, I agree with the campaign's view of the importance of ensuring appropriate records of business are taken. Where meetings involving ministers meet the criteria set out in the civil service guidance, then appropriate records are routinely taken. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for her reply. In my hand, I have a list compiled by STB journalist Aidan Kerr of 40 unminuted ministerial meetings and 
counting. This widespread practice of failure to record must end. So I commend the Get It Minuted campaign, which is simply asking that agendas, notes and minutes authorised government min uh, meetings are held. The First Minister told the Chamber earlier on she's fine with the way the Justice Secretary is conducting government business when asked about the unminuted meeting with the former chair of the SPA. Sticking with justice, her official Paul Johnson met with the Chief Constable on the 30th of November. Was that meeting also unminuted? If so, doesn't the First Minister accept it's not only a bad look, but this practice is simply wrong? So will she make a commitment today that from now on, all important government meetings will be minuted? Well, First I will Minister. make a commitment that we will continue, as we do just now, to make sure that the guidance uh, about uh, keeping minutes is complied with. That, I, I believe that guidance uh, for civil servants is publicly available for any member uh, to look at. Uh, this government has done more to put more information into the public domain than any previous administration. For example, under previous administrations, uh, it wasn't the practice to proactively publish uh, details of meetings and travel. Uh, we now do that. So we will continue to make sure that the guidance is complied with and, of course, that ministers are properly accountable to this parliament. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It was suggested earlier that no minutes were taken when the Justice Secretary met the SPA to discuss the Chief Constable because it was just a mere chat. But we checked the meeting room bookings and it shows that to have this chat, the Justice Secretary went to the trouble of booking an eight-person meeting room for two hours. So can the First Minister tell us... So can the First Minister tell us... OK, let's hear the question, please. Is it general government policy, not... Let's hear the question, please. Is it general government policy not to minute eight-person, two-hour meetings on the fate of senior public servants, or would a minister have to specifically request that no minutes are taken? First Minister. Well, look, I wasn't at the meeting, but I think I'm hearing... I'm hearing from the Justice Secretary that the meeting we're talking about actually took place in his office, so I'm not entirely sure what on earth Liam Kerr is talking about. So, if Liam Kerr wants to come back to the chamber at some point and ask a coherent question that I can understand, I'll do my best to answer it. Question seven, Tavish Scott. Thank you, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government will take to increase and improve diversity in the early learning and childcare workforce. First Minister. Uh, ensuring that we have a high quality workforce is uh, key to our plans to almost double funded nursery education uh, and of course that includes improving diversity. Phase one of our recruitment campaign was launched in October last year. The campaign encourages people from all backgrounds, abilities, age ranges and genders to consider a career in early learning and childcare. We're also increasing the number of early years modern apprenticeships by 10% year on year and we're raising the amount paid to employers and businesses to support apprentices over 25 to help widen the age profile of the workforce. Tavish Scott. I'm grateful to the First Minister for that reply. This week, her own skills agency said that the work that's going on on recruitment isn't enough and a more diverse workforce is needed. Does she therefore accept that the take-up by two-year-olds is way below expectations and many organisations doubt the Scottish Government can meet its recruitment target? Is recruitment of the 11,000 new staff needed to deliver the expansion of childcare on track? First Minister. Uh, the, the policy is, is on track. I'm, I'm not sure whether Tavish Scott is, is, is perhaps mixing up two equally uh, important issues. The, the issue of take-up of two-year-olds is important. We see very high take-up of three- and four-year-olds, and, and we want to see take-up from two-year-olds increase. Uh, that's important. It is slightly separate from the broader issue of recruitment of additional workers into the workforce to support the expansion of provision that I have spoken about. I've already set out uh, the uh, ambitions of the government to attract uh, 11,000 uh, new workers uh, into the workforce to, to support that. But in addition 
to that overall number. I think the point Tavish Scott is absolutely right to make is we want to see a greater diversity. One of the things I talk about often is the need to get more women into careers like engineering and technology, uh, the, the STEM type careers. It's equally important to encourage more men into uh, childcare professions. So these are really important matters and as part of our overall ambition to grow the workforce, uh, that need for greater diversity is central to all that we do. Michelle Ballantyne. Well, thank you. That leads very nicely into my question then, because childcare and early years has traditionally been seen as a female industry, with women accounting for 97% of the workforce. That does suggest that we could do more to encourage men to see childcare and early years for the important, rewarding career it is. So can I ask the First Minister, what steps is the Scottish Government actually taking to change perceptions of careers in childcare and early years? First Minister. Well, that's a responsibility for the Government. It's a responsibility for all of us. When I, I launched the uh, ambition, uh, the requirement for the Scottish Government to recruit thousands of more people to support our expansion, we made those points. The uh, recruitment campaign... Uh, focuses on the need for greater diversity as well as the need for growing the numbers. Uh, the the under-representation of men in careers like this is a long-standing thing. It's an intergenerational thing. Um, and it's important that we, uh, I think, take the time to explain why this is a worthwhile career uh, for men to pursue, but also why it's really important in terms of the development of our children, uh, that there are men as well as women providing uh, this care. So this is all part of tackling the, the occupational segregation that we know uh, in most professions affects women, but in this one uh, is a particular issue around men. And I think we can all uh, do as much, I hope we all do as much as we can to encourage young men in particular to see this as a very uh, worthy and worthwhile career option. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We'll move on now to members' business in the name of Maurice Corrie which is about 100 years of women in the armed forces. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.